Hello students, now I am going to discuss on the topic stone tool marking techniques and their identifying characters. First, let me introduce about the introductory part. Researches on the evolution of man and his culture have proved without doubt that our prehistoric stone age ancestors had used stone tools made by them. The likely methods used by them could be inferred. According to Professor I.S.D. Sankalia, by studying the stone tool themselves, trying to imitate them today, and observing primitive or semi-primitive people making similar tools and using them. In the book, Early Main, published by Life Nature Library in 1970, there are photographs showing the making of stone tools like shopping tool, Julian Hanexes, and laurel leaf points by Francois Bortz. Let's now move to the next point, stone tool marking technique. We can broadly group the stone tool marking techniques of prehistoric period into four. They are number one, percussion, number two, blade technique, number three, grinding and polishing, and number four, sartering technique. The percussion group has two subgroups, namely direct percussion and the indirect percussion. Now let us study on the direct percussion flaking technique. Flaking by striking directly with a hammer is known as direct percussion flaking technique. The direct percussion subgroup consists of eye techniques such as anvil or block on block technique, stone hammer or direct percussion technique, cylinder hammer or hollow hammer or bone or antler or hardwood hammer technique, bipolar technique, step or resolve or control flagging technique, Claytonian technique, level 1 technique, and discoid core or Mauserian technique. Now let us come to the next point, anvil or block on block technique. In this technique, a lump of stone to a flag is held in one or both hands and a strike directly against a projected edge of a fixed huge block of stone or anvil. These results to the detachment of a large massive plate from the stone lump in hand with a prominent bulb of percussion. Such large primary flags could be used in making tools like some of the hanexes and cleavers. Now let's come to the next point stone hammer technique. A suitable shaped stone is used as hammer and a strike at an inclined angle on the surface of a lump of stone and that results to the removal of a flag with a positive bulb of percussion. On the core, there is a hollow or concave surface corresponding to the shape and the size of the detached flag. This concave surface is called negative bulb of percussion. Now let's come to the next point, cylinder hammer technique. Tools of the Acheulean stage of the lower Paleolithic culture shows a very flat bulb 
of applied force actually means made by M. Coutier and Leakey have suggested that a slender hammer of soft stone, bone or wood was used in detaching such flat flags. Leakey states, quote, very flat flagging is achieved partly because of the blow is struck with a soft curve edge and a note with a point, and partly because when using such a hammer, it is impossible to strike a blow except at the very edge of the block which is to be trimmed. Uncut. Now let's come to the next point that is bipolar technique. This technique of flagging is less common, but it is considered economical in the sense that with a single blow, two flags could be detached simultaneously. For this, the core is placed upon another hard rock and strike with the hammer or the upper free end of the core. Due to the rebound of the force from the underlying rock and the force of the hammer blow on the upper end, two flags, one from each opposite end, have been removed on the same face of the core. The presence of radiating fissures on the same face of the opposite ends of the core is the character of the bipolar technique. Now let us talk on step or resolve or control flagging technique. In this case, the hammer does not strike at an inclined angle to the surface, but inward the core with a control blow or force, so that the penetrating force does not pass through, but ends inside the core to snap off a flag abruptly, leaving a step on the core. Sometimes the snap of flags curl over the end parties from the bulb. This is known as hinge fracture. According to Leakey, such fracture is difficult to produce at will. A hinge fracture is distinguishable from step fracture by its smooth surface. Now let us discuss on the next point that is Clactonian technique. It is a technique of detaching a large flag for making flag tools. Clactonian flags could also be obtained by using the anvil or stone hammer technique. In this case, a naturally flattened surface is used as striking platform of the hammer. Such flag will have a prominent bulb of protection on the main flag surface near the striking platform and the angle between the main flag surface and the striking platform is always greater than 90 degree or roughly 120 degree. Next point is level 1 technique. This is a technique of obtaining a flake to make tools. The main characteristics of this technique is the extensive preparation of the core and the striking platform, that is, faceted striking platform by using stone hammer. Only one flag could be obtained from such a prepared core and the flag resembles the form of a tortoise shell. It is also known as tortoise core technique. The flag has very sharp margin due to the truncation of the previously prepared flag skirts on the dorsal with the main flag surface and could be used as tool without further working. The angle between the main flag surface and the striking platform is almost near to 90 degree. Let's move to the next tool making technique that is discoid core or mousterian technique. This is also a prepared core technique for obtaining a flake. In this case, 
the prepio code resembles a circular or dig shape. Any one of the flex curves on the course serve a striking platform, and a plaque with two to four truncated flex curves on the dorsal surface could be detached by striking with a stone hammer. The flex curve laid on the core after detaching the first flag could also be served a striking platform for detaching another flag. Thus, several flags could be obtained from a single discoid core. Now, let's come to the next point in direct percussion technique. It is one of the methods of obtaining a blade by the prehistoric man. In this case, the prepared cylindrical core is not struck directly by the hammer but through a punch. The pointed end of the punch is fixed on the striking platform of the core and then hammer on the other end of the punch. This resulted to the removal of a thin lead that exhibits numerous closely placed prominent ripples on the main flag surface. The next tool making group is blade technique. This is the technique known to men for the first time during the Middle Paleolithic. By this method, long, narrow, thin, and barrel sided flags have been produced in different parts of the world during the Paleolithic period. But this technique has been regularly and extensively used during the Upper Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and later periods. Some of the advanced techniques which were frequently used by prehistoric men to procure blades are pressure flagging technique or blade by pressure, fluting technique or blade by percussion, and lastly, backing or blunting. Now let us talk on pressure flagging technique. It is a technique used by prehistoric men. In this case also, an intermediary implement sharp a sponge is used to exert force on the core by applying pressure, but not by hammering. Very thin and small waist flags or sheaves, known also as fish scale, could be removed for finishing the tools like leaf shaped points during the upper Paleolithic culture. Long blades could also be obtained by this technique. It is often difficult to distinguish indirect percussion from pressure flagging. Both the methods are in fact a form of indirect pressure. Now let's come to the next point, fluting technique. It was used for making blade tools. In this technique, starting with suitably prepared cylindrical nodule, a series of uniformly thin parallel sided blades were detached in rapid succession by applying vertical pressures on the edges. The blades produced by fluting were, however, crested with multiple flex curves transversely across the crease. On the other hand, some scholars prefer to call this technique as punching technique because in this technique, a rough surface is made on the core thereafter. A small platform is prepared at one end. Against this is placed a short wood punch and a tap is given with the help of a mallet. Now come to the next point, backing or blunting technique. Blades manufactured by fluting technique were further returns to form specific tools. Since every blade had two ready-made sharp edges, retouching in these blades we are mainly done to blunt any specific area out of the two already present borders. The area chosen 
and the manner of the blunting depend on the requirement of the maker. These bluntings were done mainly to afford a firm hafting of blades on handles. Now let us come to the third group of tool making technique that is grinding and polishing. This technique is a characteristic feature of making the Neolithic tools. Though the Neolithic stone tools are shaped by applying various methods of percussion flaking and packing, the rough flaking or packing surfaces are further worked by grinding and polishing technique to produce smooth and polished surfaces. Let's come to the fourth group of tool making technique that is shattering technique. This type of tool making technique is very simple. In this technique, the manufacturer holds the suitable stone with his hands or both hands and raises to a certain height and then releases the scene so as the rock breaks into pieces when it hits the ground. The flags or rock pieces thus produced do not possess either negative or positive bulb of percussion. From such flags, any required size can be selected and trimmed further by using either grinding or stone hammering. This tool making technique is confined to Southeast Asia. Above all, there are two more flaking techniques. They are the primary flaking techniques and the secondary flaking technique. Based on the nature of the flag skirts as well as its workmanship, such flaking can be done by using any one of the percussion or blade technique. Now let us see how these techniques works. Now let's come to the primary flaking technique. After selecting a suitable piece of rock, the prehistoric man will start flaking to get the conceptualized form of the tool. All such flags, details for getting the desired shape and the size of the tool are primary flags. However, the characters of the flex details exhibit differently according to the particular technique and hammer use. For example, the flex removed by the anvil technique and direct stone percussion technique with heavy hammer will produce massive flex with prominent bulb of percussion. While smaller and flatter flags can be obtained by using slender hammer technique. The main purpose of the primary flagging is to get the desired shape and the size of the tool. Now come to the secondary flagging technique. Secondary flaggings are those further flaggings after obtaining the desired shape and the size for producing self working ease and the suitable hand holding place of the tools. The secondary flagging could be done either by the direct percussion technique with smaller stone hammer or cylinder hammer technique and pressure flagging. Step flagging is also evident in the secondary flagging. The flags removed in step flagging are generally small and has a blunt end due to the sudden break of the force in the core material. The size of the secondary flag is generally small and known as waist flags or chip. Now let's come to the concluding part. Early men employed different types of stone tool making techniques from Paleolithic period and continued till the Chalcolithic period through Mesolithic.
and Neolithic stages. These various tool making techniques are broadly grouped into four. Each group has a number of techniques or stages. Thank you.